Well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Lindsay Sears and I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about population management for xenarthran species in AZA facilities. Um, I am currently the Interactive Animal Programs Manager at the Omaha's Henry Billy Zoo and Aquarium in Omaha, Nebraska. But today I'm speaking to you um, in my role as the chair for the AZA Pangolin, Aardvark, and Xenarthra Taxon Advisory Group. Um, and just a little bit about me and my background. Um, I have been working at the Omaha Zoo since 2007. Um, and I've been in my current role for about a year, but before that, I spent 15 years working in um, the zoo's Desert Dome and Kingdoms of the Night areas, which has a very diverse uh, collection of small mammals, um, including sloths and armadillos. And it's um, while I was in the dome that I really discovered my love and passion for um, xenarthran species. So I joined the um, Pangolin Aardvark and Xenarthra tag or PAX tag um, in 2013 as a steering committee member. And then I became the chair of the tag in 2016. Um, so um, I've been very heavily involved in um, the management of Xenarthran species in addition to Pangolin and Aardvarks um, in AZA Zoo since then. So, um, so that's what I'm going to give an overview of today. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so first, um, for anyone that's not familiar, I would like to just give a very general overview of AZA population management, ma management or as it's called in AZA animal programs. Um, now, this is a very broad topic. It can be a very complex topic. And so I'm pretty much just giving a crash course and go in very basic uh, overview of animal programs in AZA. And then afterwards, I will talk more specifically about xenarthran species. Um, all right, so AZA stands for the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And the mission of AZA is to provide its members with the services and high standards, best practices, and program coordination to be leaders in animal welfare, public engagement, and the conservation of species. Um, and AZA offers membership to facilities through accreditation. Um, and facilities earn this accreditation through an application and a very intensive and extensive on-site inspection. Um, and then once facilities, um, zoos and aquariums, gain this accreditation, they must re be reaccredited every five years to maintain accre accreditation. Um, and so currently, there are 238 accredited zoos and aquariums. There are 15 certified facilities, and certified facilities are um, facilities that are not open to the public, but they still meet all the AZA standards. Um, and some examples would be the Luby Bat Conservancy and the, Lem the Lemur Conservation Foundation, both in Florida. Um, there are currently uh, AZA institutions in 46 US states um, and also 13 countries. So um, you don't, uh, facilities don't have to just be based in North America to be accredited by AZA. Um, they, it, there's uh, AZA accredited institutions throughout the world. Um, and so AZA defines um, their, their population management program for species housed in AZA facilities as animal programs. And the mission of AZA's animal programs is to maintain healthy, genetically diverse populations through strategic management and planning so that visitors can continue to gain a personal appreciation for the species and the care of AZA facilities for generations to come. So one thing that I wanted to point out is, you know, not only is it what it says, but also what it's not saying. Um, it does not say anything about conservation or um, in C2 populations, populations in the wild. It's a common misconception that AZA population management is to um, conserve the species in the wild, but actually it's to maintain um, it's to maintain species and populations in zoos so we can keep these animals in zoos for generations to come. Now, that doesn't mean that conservation work isn't happening at zoos and that species and animals aren't necessarily being and are being reintroduced into the wild, but those are a separate entity um, right now that are called safe species. And I'm not going to um, talk much about that today. 
But for our purposes, population management animal programs in AZA is to continue to maintain genetically and demographically diverse populations within zoos, within AZA zoos. Um, and so this is the, um, the org chart um, for AZA programs. So um, the AZA board of directors oversees all of AZA. And then one of the departments within um, AZA is the Conservation Management Welfare Sciences Department or the Animal Programs Department. Now this, this is composed of AZA staff. They are, um, they are employed by, directly by AZA. And then they oversee the Animal Population Management Committee. And everything from the Animal Population Management Committee on down um, in tags and um, species survival plans and regional stud books, these are all composed of um, staff of AZA zoos and aquariums. And so pretty much everybody working um, on the Animal Population Management Committee on down, these are, these are voluntary positions. The Reproductive Management Center and the Population Management Center, these are, um, these are uh, organizations that are um, within zoos. The PMC, the Population Management Center is in Lincoln Park, is in the, at the Lincoln Park Zoo, and the Reproductive Management Center is at the St. Louis Zoo. And the Population Management Center, especially, they employ the population biologists that help um, that help with all the population analysis for the um, for the the uh, species survival plans programs, which I'll be talking about. Um, and so I'm going to kind of go down um, each step of the the org chart um, to give an overview of each uh, entity. Okay, there we go. So the first is the animal population uh, the, the animal population management committee. So this, this is the committee that oversees all animal programs. Um, they are also responsible for enforcing um, any AZA policies that regarding animal programs. And they also review and approve any um, uh, documents that are required for, the, for animal programs. And again, members of the, of the Animal Population Management Committee are uh, made up of directors, vice presidents, curators, um, keepers of, uh, that are staff members of AZA zoos and aquariums. Um, and so the, the APMC oversees taxon, the taxon advisory groups or the TAGs. And the TAGs are responsible for um, the management of all the species within the taxa that fall within that, that TAG's purview. Um, they establish the priorities for animal management, research, scientific initiatives for the TAG. And then they are also responsible for developing the regional collection plan um, every five years and TAG annual reports. Um, they also oversee the respective species survival plan programs that fall within the TAG's purview, and they support and advise those program leaders. There are uh, currently 42 AZA TAGs, and it, um, because every, every species within AZA facilities has to be represented by a TAG. So some examples include the Felid TAG, Ape TAG, snake tag, and of course the penguin aardvarks and arthra tag or the pax tag. Um, and so one of the most important responsibilities for the tag is to um, develop the regional collection plan. And this is what I'm gonna be talking um, a lot about later on in the presentation. Um, and this document recommends species within the tag that um, for cooperative management by um, an animal program. And then they designate those recommended species um, as a specific animal program. They also assess the current sustainability of each animal program. And then they identify the animal program roles, goals, and any essential actions. Um, and this document is developed by the TAG every five years. It is a pretty extensive and arduous task. So it's, it's only done every five years. Um, and then next, so the taxon advisory groups, the TAGs, they oversee the stud books and the species survival plans. And this, this, the stud books and the SSPs go hand in hand. So first, 
An AZA regional stud book um, documents the pedigree and entire demographic history of each individual animal within a managed population in AZA institutions, conservation partners, and those certified related facilities. Um, and then these uh, these histories then become the, the population's genetic and demographic identi identity, and then they become valuable tools to track each individual within that XC2 population. Because again, the stud book is monitoring the, the population in zoos and aquariums, not the wild. Um, the stud book is managed by a stud book keeper, and then most often the stud book keeper is also working as and serving as the SSP coordinator as well in a dual role. Um, all the stud book data information um, about each individual animal is then used to produce a breeding and transfer plan for the SSP. And at the um, and on each slide, I have included a link because all this information and more information about each of these is available on the AZA website, aza.org. I mean, so next is the Species Survival Plans or SSP. That's probably what I'll be referring to it as uh, for the rest of the pro or the presentation. Um, and so the SSPs are responsible for managing the XC2 species population within AZA facilities and sustainability partners and certified facilities. Now, sustainability partners are actually non non-AZA facilities that have been approved to be a part and to, to participate in the SSP. Um, the SSP is managed by the SSP coordinator, again, who is most often the stud book keeper as well. Um, and there are currently, as of January 2023, 288 SSPs. Um, the SSP program just went through a, a huge reimagination process. Um, and there were 574 SSPs before, and then now after the reimagination, that has been uh, in, decreased to 288. Um, and each SSP program is responsible for developing a breeding and transfer plan, and that is done in collaboration with the Population Management Center, um, a population biologist at the PMC who works at the Lincoln Park Zoo, um, any program leaders, the SSP coordinator, the stud book keeper, um, and also institutional representatives from each participating institution, um, you know, each AZA facility that holds that species. Um, and then breeding and transfer plans summarize the current demographic and genetic status of the population. And then that's where all breeding and transfer recommendations are made. Now this um, breeding and transfer plans are usually developed every three years for most SSPs. And then interim breeding and transfer recommendations are made um, within the three years. Um, but the frequency can vary based on the species biology and the species needs. Um, and so, like I said, the, the SSP uh, program just went through a huge reimagination process. It was about a two to three year um, process where um, AZA and the Animal Population Management Committee um, came up with new ways to categorize and um, describe uh, SSPs. And they also made it make the criteria a little more difficult for species to attain that SSP designation. Um, before January two, 2023, um, population, species populations in AZA facilities um, were basically evaluated using only one criteria, and that was genetic diversity. That was the population's ability to maintain 90% 90, 90 genetic diversity for 100, for 100 years. And then, and then the SSP was categorized based on that. But now SSP sustainability is assessed using four criteria. So in addition to genetics, we're also assessing based on demography, space and interest, and, and husbandry. And so now there are three new SSP designations that we are all using now, and they are secure, signature, and provisional. Um, so the secure is the is is the most sustainable uh, SSP. Th these are populations that have been that are viewed as 
the populations and the species that we are pretty certain will still be present in zoos and aquariums in 100 years in a very robust, viable, and healthy population by meeting all of those four criteria. And at this time, um, there, to my knowledge, there no species have yet been um, identified as secure. They're still working that out. Um, so right now, we're pretty much just using the signature of the provisional SSP designation. And so signature is any species populations that meets all of the four criteria and is on track for long-term sustainability. Um, but then a pr provisional SSP is a population that's more on the cusp. So they are not meeting all of the criteria, but they have the potential to meet them within a, time, a, a certain time frame. Um, and so the provisional SSPs have been tasked with developing SMART goals and, mu and they must show measur measurable progress towards becoming a signature SSP to, to maintain their SSP status. Um, the provisional SSP designation is meant to be more of a temporary categorization. It's not supposed to be long-term. Um, and so how that is the how, so how each species within AZA is assessed is first they must go through a they, they must be uh, go through a flow chart. And so the first hurdle that a species has to uh, pass is that species must be held at 15 or more AZA facilities. And um, and this is new because before an SSP, it really had nothing to do with how many, it really didn't have a lot to do with how many hold, holding institutions they had. Um, and so if a species is not held at more than 15 AZA institutions, it is not an, it, it is not an SSP. Um, but if it is, then, it, then we, we move forward and um, breeding then must exceed private acquisitions. Um, and then the majority of animals must be held in AZA facilities and not non-AZA sustainability partners. And if they can meet those three criteria, then they, can, they move on to another SSP assessment. And any species not meeting those three, those three criteria then become most likely tag endorsed, and then they only maintain the stud book, and they do not produce a formal breeding and transfer plan. Um, or they just, there, there's no stud book uh, at all and they're just not an SSP anymore and not, not monitored at all, which I don't really think is, is happening that much. I think the tags are monitoring all species that were previously an SSP. So again, once, even though an, a, a, a population may pass those first three criteria, then they're going to be re, re, they're going to be evaluated even more on those four criteria, the genetics, demography, space and interest, and husbandry. And there's going to be a plus, a neutral, or a negative. Um, and, and then, so if a so if a population has two or more positives and no negatives, they they become an SSP, a signature SSP. If they have any negatives at all, they they cannot be a signature. So um, so if if they have um, if they have less than two negatives, then they become a provisional. But any any population that has more that two or more negatives in any of those categories they are no longer an SSP and they become a stud book tag monitor population. All right, so again, that was just a very brief overview um, of AZA population management and those SSP designations. Um, and so I just, so now I wanna talk about how, how this applies to Zanarthran species in AZA facilities. Um, and so, um, so just a, a, a basic broad overview of the pangolin aardvarks and arthur tag or pax tag. Um, we are responsible for the management of pangolins, aardvarks, anteaters, sloths, and armadillos in AZA facilities. Now I wanna make sure that everybody knows, we know, AZA knows that these all these species are not taxonomically related, um, but um, I think the thought was is that they're all very unique species that share similar biology and natural history. So they kind of just lumped all pangolins and aardvarks in with the xenarthrans. But we are very aware that they that pangolins and aardvarks are not xenarthrans. Um, 
And so, and luckily for, for the PAX tag, is interest in our species in AZA facilities is consistently high. Um, our the spe Zenarthran species are um, are really uh, in demand for ambassador animal programs and also mixed species exhibits in AZA facilities. And right now, the PAX tag oversees SSP programs for eight species. Um, but we just recently developed our um, our regional collection plan 2022, and during that process we identified several factors that impact the sustainability for the managed species in, in those SSPs. And right now, um, the three main factors impacting sustainability are those ambassador animal or education programs. Seven out of the eight SSPs uh, species are largely managed in ambassador animal program departments in AZA institutions. Um, and historically, animals and ambassador animal programs are generally housed alone, and institutions can be hesitant to participate in breeding that may hinder that animal's ability to participate in education programming. Um, and then also, if an institution is not able to acquire an animal from within the, F the SSP population, most likely due to high demand for that species, then they then usually Xenarthran species can easily be acquired from the private sector. And these animals are going to lack demographic and pedigree in information. And so then they really cannot really be a part of the, the breeding population because we don't know much about their history. Now, I will say that I have seen great strides made in ambassador animal programs. Um, I really think that as institutions and animal programs, we're making great strides in bridging the gap um, between SSPs and breeding and ambassador animal programs. And I have seen a lot of ambassador animal programs really trying to make that more of a priority and participate more in SSPs. Um, but then also a, a major hindrance um, to sustainability for uh, PAX tag species, and you know, especially the Xenarthran species, is low production of offspring um, and then high infant mortality. Um, and the, the low production of offspring, it can be due to reproductive biology of, of the species, but also institutions can have challenges in providing the appropriate husbandry to facilitate breeding and pregnancy, and then ultimately um, infant survival. So these, are, again, are all challenges that the PAX tag and, you know, and the holding institutions were and the, pro, the SSPs that we're all trying to work through um, so we can continue to maintain um, sustainable Xenarthran populations. Um, and so the, the most recent PAX tag regional collection plan was just published in November 2022. It was the third edition of the regional collection plan for the tag. Um, and then from this, so we have, we, we have eight SSPs, we have four signature SSPs, and we have four provisional SSPs. Now, I am very proud and happy to say that we were one of the, the, out of the 42 tags, we were one of maybe two or three tags that maintained all of their SSPs through the reimagination. We didn't lose any SSPs, and that is, um, that's, that's really, really great for us. But we have, a, we have a lot of work to do. So our four signature SSPs, again, these are gonna be the, the ones that are meeting those four criteria and they are on track for long-term sustainability. And right now, those are giant anteater, lens two-toed sloth, screaming armadillo, and southern three-banded armadillo. Now the four provisional SSPs that, again, those are the SSPs that are more on the cusp. Those are aardvark, Hoffman's two-toed sloth, six-banded armadillo, and southern tamandua. And so we have a lot of work to do with those, especially with those four provisional SSPs. Um, and we have, uh, you know, over the next five years until the next RFCP is developed in 2027, we have to really do a lot of work and identify you know, what factors are hindering these specific provisional SSPs from, from um, maintaining sustainability and hopefully be able to uh, overcome those so then they can move up to signature SSP and not lose their SSP status. Um, 
and especially for, um, I know aardvarks are not zonarthrins, but I'm still going to talk about them and, and, and throw them in there. But especially for aardvark and six-banded armadillos, those are smaller populations within AZA. And so, you know, it's just also trying to find holding, um, holding institutions for those species. Um, and so this is how those eight SSPs, um, what the, the assessment results when we when we ran them through the flowchart and then the assessment. This is how um, how they they fell out. And so um, they they're all they're all held at fifteen or more AZ institutions, and so they all met those first criteria. Um, but the four provisional SSPs, Aardvark, Hoffman's, Six Banded, and, and um, Tamandua, um, they, so Aardvark and um, Hoffman's and Tamandua, they had at least one negative in a column. And so they were automatically a provisional. They could not, they could not be a signature. Now, Six Banded doesn't have any negatives, but they did not have two or more positives. They had three neutrals out of the four categories. And so that's why they are classified as provisional. But then all others had that two or more positives in the four columns. So they are signature SSPs. Um, and so this is, again, this is as of um, 2022. Um, so this is the current program designation for each of the SSP, the current population size. Um, the current number of participating AZA institutions, the five-year lambda, you know, um, the population trend, um, and then also the date of the most recent breeding and transfer plan. And so most of the information that was used in these SSP assessments were taken from the most recent breeding and transfer plan because a lot of demographic and population analysis is done during that process. Um, and so, now, and so an SSP designation or a population's designation can change. And so the, the status of the managed species will, will be reevaluated again in the next RCP in 2027 to see if any of these designations should change. And I'm hoping that, you know, with a lot of work um, and a lot of time and effort on the part of the program leaders, that those provisionals will move up to signature. Um, and because once again, that per my understanding, and because this is all very new, we're still learning um, about the new designations, but my understanding is that the provisional is a temporary classification. And so these provisional SSPs have five years to hopefully move up to signature SSP. Um, and so it, uh, also in the regional collection plan, every SSP has to come up with at least three SMART goals um, because, you know, it's it's not it's not just, um, you know, producing a breeding and transfer plan every three years. There's a lot of work involved for the program leader. And so I'm just giving you a, a snapshot of both um, two-toed sloth populations and that this, that both sloth populations are actually managed by one SSP coordinator and each sloth population has a separate stud book keeper. So those people are working together with these um, to, to work on these goals and to make progress. Now you can see that Hoffman's is the provisional. So they have an additional goal um, that's more centered around um, any factors of uh, breeding that could be in, impacting and hindering sustainability. And so uh, that's more focused, that goal is more focused on, again, trying to hopefully get Hoffman's from a, from a provisional to a signature. Um, but Lynn's is a signature. And so um, even though they have similar goals to Hoffman's, they don't necessarily need that much focus on breeding and, and population sustainability. Um, and so now that doesn't mean, now outside of the eight, eight SSPs, that doesn't mean that these are the only Xenarthrin or Pax tag species that are housed in AZA facilities. These are the only, these are just the species that were that were recommended for SSP and who made it through the assessment. Um, but we also have other species that are um, that are housed in AZA facilities, but they are uh, they are they are non-managed. So we call those the non-managed species. So there are white-bellied pangolin. Um, there, as of 2022, there were four large hairy armadillos. 
um, nine banner armadillos, three brown throated sloths, and then one northern tamandua. Now, so southern tamandua is the species that is managed as an SSP, not northern, and, and, um, and there's just one. Now, um, you're probably noticing that nine banner armadillos, it, they are very popular um, and they are very prevalent in AZA institutions. They're, they're housed in um, 42 AZA facilities. And so that is more than 40, that is more than 15. Um, however, private acquisitions outnumber births. And so that, so again, that the species does not meet SSP criteria because of that and is, and is listed as tag monitored. Um, and then also the phase out species, um, that kind of, you know, sounds very negative and, um, and kind of has, has more of a negative connotation, but um, the phase out species, the tag does not have any strat, does not have a strategy to actively remove or reduce these species within AZ institutions. Just because they're, they're listed as phase out doesn't mean that we're going to the one AZ institution that has large hairy armadillo and saying, you have to get rid of all of them. We're just saying we know that they're there, but we have, because there's just so few, we don't really see them ever really um, approaching sustainability and SSP status. So we're just more saying, you know, we know that they're there and they can phase out naturally by attrition. Um, and then once again, the, the non-managed species, their status will also be reevaluated in 2027 when we do the next regional collection plan um, to see if, the, if any of these designations should change because things are fluid and things and, and you know, populations and, and species within zoos are always are, are always evolving and so things can change within five years. Um, and so uh, one thing I you know this is the table of contents for the regional collection plan. It is a, a very large extensive document and again I'm just scratching the surface I'm basically I'm just focusing on the um, the, the SSP species. Um, but there is a lot more within this regional collection plan, and you know this is just a snapshot of what else is, of what else is in there. Um, the PAX tag regional collection plan is available on the AZA website, but you do need to have an AZA membership and a login um, to access it. But if you don't have that and you are interested in um, in, in this document or any other um, breeding and transfer plans, you know you could contact me, and I could and I'd be happy to provide it. Um, and so, uh, so again, this is just a very um, brief overview of population management within AZA uh, zoos, and then also, you know, specifically for zoonarthrins. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you so much. Thank you to Mary Ellen Kenny for reaching out and um, asking me to present. Um, and, and again, if you have any questions or if you would like uh, more information or access to those documents, please feel free to reach out to me um, and I'd be happy to share more because again, this is, it is a very broad topic. Um, so, but yeah, th uh, thank you for having me and, um, and are there any questions? Uh, thank you so much, Lindsay. Before we're going to get to the questions, I just want to tell everyone a little bit about the specialist group. And then during that time, if we can come up with some more questions, that would also be good. All right, so there we go. Um, we are part of the IUCN SSC, Anteater Sloth and Armadillo Specialist Group. Our website is anarthrins.org. We have an Instagram page, we have a Facebook page, and we have a pretty new YouTube page where you can see all of the past uh, Zenarthrin webinars, but you can also see some other really cool stuff, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. If you go to zenarthrins.org, you will see that we have uh, lots of different tabs. One of them is about the species, so you can learn more about all of the armadillo, sloth, and anteater species. And just this year, we had uh, some species split up, so we will have new pages on those new species very soon. Like I was uh, alluding to. If you go to our YouTube page or our Facebook page, you will also see 
four animated videos about xenarthrons. We have one about ancient extinct xenarthrons, and then we also have three videos on modern day sloths and educational programming. All of the videos are about five minutes long, and they are perfect for elementary and middle school students, but high school students will also enjoy them. If you go to our website under the education tab, you will see that we have activity sheets for K through 12 students that directly relate and reflect those videos that I was just mentioning. We have coloring sheets, we have spot the difference activities, we have crosswords and word searches and puzzles. And the great thing about all of those videos that I mentioned and all of these activities is that they are in Portuguese, Spanish, and English. Coming up on the schedule is next month's webinar, July 11th. We are going to be discussing how to estimate armadillo densities with the newly uh, doctored Roxanne. So we are excited to have her. And I wanted to mention because Lindsay's presentation was about animals in AZA facilities. Last month, we had Jennifer Stoddard, and she talked about specifically tomandos, but also a little bit about other uh, xenarthrins in ambassador programs. So you can watch that past webinar on our YouTube or our Facebook page. If you are at a AZA facility, or if you are working with xenarthrins in the wild, I would love to receive small little videos or photos of your animals so we can highlight them on our social media platforms. And if you are taking photos and sending them to me, please be mindful of cages and bars. We want to show Xenarthrins in the best light. If you feel inspired to donate to our specialist group, which helps support Xenarthrin conservation animals in the wild, you can go to our website and there's a donate button. And if you don't want to just give out right, you can see that I'm wearing this awesome maned sloth shirt because they're one of my favorite sloth species. And if you go to anteater sloth and armadillo dot creator slash or dash spring dot com, you will see we have a lot of merchandise. We have t-shirts and tote bags and mugs about all the different anteaters, lots of different sloth species, two-toed, three-toed. We have lots of different armadillo species. And then when you purchase these items, they, this company ships worldwide. When you buy these items, you are supporting Xenarthrin conservation. We also have some merchandise that <laughs> includes extinct uh, Xenarthrins, like this giant glyptodon and a giant uh, extinct uh, sloth species. And we'd like to give a little shout out to our partner institutions, which help with all of our education component and including the webinars. And those two organizations are FIA, the Foundation for International Aid to Animals and Nurtured by Nature. All right, Lindsay, now I'm ready for you. <laughs> and I'm going to read them to you because the people who are watching this will not be able to see the questions. All right. So, Lindsay, have you experienced any problems or a fear of sloth hybrids between the two two-toed sloth species in AZA institutions? Um, yes, that that is always a concern um, that we want to make sure that we we know the species um, identification for the sloths because we know that, you know, just visual assessment um, isn't 100 percent accurate. Now, Generally, you, we do not do any genetic analysis for you know animals in SSPs. Um, basically, breeding and transfer plan, or sorry, breeding recommendations are all based on pedigree, and relatedness is all based on pedigree. So we don't really do a lot of genetic analysis. But genetic analysis has been done um, a lot in the sloth populations. Um, to, to properly identify the, the individual sloths. And so then as the AZA population becomes more known, then we can be more confident about making breeding and transfer recommendations. And because again, both um, Hoffman's and Lynn's are managed as separate SSPs, as separate populations. Um, and, um, and so yes, ge genetic analysis, 
to identify species has been done in, um, in SLOSS. All right, very good. Now, we of course want to support Xenarthrin uh, conservation and research. And one fear or uh, question that a lot of people have is, do the advisors for SSP and tax or the stud bookkeepers, are they supposed to be supported by their home institution or are they expected to be volunteering outside of their daily zoo job? Um, well, yes, all the program leader roles, they are all voluntary. Um, and so, so people are doing this, myself included, we're doing this in, a, in addition to our day job. But in order to even apply, to be a program leader, you have to have you have to have institutional support. You have to have um, your application signed by the director, um, say, saying that the institution does support. So hopefully, every institution is different, but hopefully, the program leaders at each institution are being given the proper resources, equipment, and time to um, to do their uh, their program leader duties, but but it is outside of our um, our daily jobs. All right, very good. Mariella was wondering if you know which facilities keep the brown throated three toed three fingered sloths. Um, at this and time, it is Dallas World Aquarium in Dallas, Texas. All right, very good. And the ambassador team at the San Diego Zoo would like to know. Can you give us some examples of the qualifications for the husbandry criteria? How do you measure the negative, neutral, and positive for each criteria? Oh, this, I will say out of the four criteria, husbandry was the most difficult to assess hus because husbandry was the most subjective. So basically the husbandry criteria is all based on meeting birth goals. So in the breeding and transfer plan, um, based on species biology, but also the target population set by the tag based on, you know, space and demand for the species, the tag will set a target's population size. And so in the breeding and transfer plan, they will come up with a birth, a birth goal, like a birth rate goal of how many births need to happen per year to meet this target population size. And so the husbandry criteria was all what, what is hindering is anything hindering a population from meeting these birth goals? And that's where a lot of the provisional SSPs, they got that negative because um, six-banded armadillo, aardvark, um, especially, they have a lot of husbandry challenges that hinder meeting those birth goals. But also aardvark, um, it's, it's also species biology um, really, you know, hinders that from meeting, you know, from get, having a lot of births throughout the year. And so, um, so yes, husbandry was, was all based around a population meeting their birth goals. Now, Christian, who we mentioned was, is in Chile right now. He said, uh, congrats on the presentation. It was wonderful. Sorry, I was a little late. Does AZA have programs for reintroduction into the wild of Xenarthens? Now, I know you said at the beginning of the program that it's kind of two separate entities. And, and not at this time. We do not have, um, for, specifically for Xenarthens, we do not have any programs for reintroductions into the wild. Um, the SSP programs, the, the goal is maintaining these populations within AZA zoos and aquariums. Um, but I do know that, um, especially off the top of my head, in, in amphibians, there are um, there are re reproduction um, reintroduction programs. In fact, here at the Omaha Zoo, um, we do, we reintroduce um, Wyoming toads and Puerto Rican crested toads back into the wild. But that's a separate entity that is now, um, I believe, called Safe Safe Program, saving animals from extinction. So many of the people who are attending this webinar are zookeepers, and the ambassador team at San Diego Zoo says. Is there something specific we can do to support the taxonomic advisory group's work? For example, data, is there data or publications or stuff that they should be sending to specific uh, TAG advisors? Um, oh, I think that's a great question. Um, and I love to see the enthusiasm. I think what I would say is collaborating with the SSP coordinator, especially if you hold those provisional SSP species, you know, doing constant, being in constant communication and providing 
information to those SSP coordinators to try to figure out the challenges that are impacting sustainability. Um, and because, uh, for instance, you know, in, in Tamandua, um, in the Tamandua population, um, the SSP coordinator has really worked hard to get um, ambassador animal departments to breed, but usually then, uh, you know, institutions will breed and they'll breed once and then they'll, you know, but then they don't, maybe they, they don't want to breed anymore or, um, and so it's just really being very open to the needs of the SSP coordinator. And, but, and I, and again, I think, you know, we've done such a good job of, of collaboration and just keeping that going um, and maintaining that balance of the needs of the SSP, but also the needs of the, of the institution. And so if the SSP coordinator reaches out for information, please communicate, um, please, you know, please be, be ready, ready and willing to help. Very good. And I knew a couple stud book uh, people, and they would say it was it was pretty difficult to wrangle everyone. Yes, yes. To... Communica communication <laughs> can be the, the, the hardest yeah. <laughs> thing. All right. So thank you so much, Lindsay. If you look in the chat, you have lots of thank yous and excellent presentations. Yeah, well, thank and, you. And we appreciate it greatly. Somebody did ask me, can you repeat where you would like, where I would like the photos and videos submitted? And that is a great question. So if you go to zenarthrans.org, there is a contact us uh, function. And if you contact us, you cannot submit a photo or video on the website, but once you contact us, then we'll tell you the instructions. Or if you're attending this live, I put my personal email address in the chat function. And Mariella, our fearless leader, would like to remind all of you zookeepers and people working in AZA facilities that we have a journal and it's now it's called Xenarthra. It was formerly a dentata, but uh, we've changed the name to reflect the appropriate taxonomic uh, filing. So we would love to publish your articles written about zookeepers, about breeding, about husbandry, about troubleshooting, challenges, trials, tribulations, you know all of that. So uh, you can also contact us through the zenarthrin.org website and we will tell you, um, well, you'll actually see the uh, form of how to write for that journal and we'd be happy to answer any of your questions. And uh, once again, thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. Bye everyone.